Hey, here we are. Uh, before I begin, I would like to give a shout out to the newest Zen Sandwich supporter on Patreon. Actually, she's going to get a bilingual shout out. All right, I'm going to try at least. Uh, so thank you in English to Rose Rosemary Gill. Y en español, gracias, Rosemary Gill. Oh, my pronunciation is terrible these days. Anyway, I am uh, so delighted to have an entrepreneur back on the show. It's been a while, and I've had some recent solo episodes on starting before you're ready, and life begins at the edge of your comfort zone. Not going over the edge, mind you, because that has to do a little bit with what we're talking about today, but having a willingness to safely push your boundaries. So my guest today kind of falls right in line with a sort of inadvertent theme I've had going on. It wasn't by design, it's just flowed that way. But Professor Pete Alexander is so much more than an entrepreneur. Yes, he is the president of Office Plants by Everything Grows, a very successful interior landscaping company based in the San Francisco, California area. But he also helps folks deal with their stress more effectively through Lighten. That's a, a trademark name, Lighten stress management model that he developed which motivates people to take action in just a few minutes per day. And that works well here. I do a five minute Zen segment at uh, each episode for similar reasons, but that through stress management techniques, people can better protect their health and handle challenging situations in life. I'll ask you more about that in a moment. He's also an author of an international best-selling book, lighten your day fast and uh, excuse me, lighten your day fast, easy and effective stress relief. For When Shit Happens is the full title, I believe. Uh, the, the book is almost more like a reference guide to keep handy with you at all times. There are hundreds of fast, effective tips designed to be used in the present moment. And the book is organized around a variety of areas of life. So, for example, if you're stressed about hitting your sales quota, you'd take a look at the livelihood or time chapter. Or if you're anxious about your next doctor's appointment, you go to health or genius chapter. Meeting your in-laws, flip over to the network chapter. It's a really cool idea. Uh, professor Pete is also a professor and educator. He's an adjunct professor for Antioch uh, University, where he helps students develop and apply key concepts of marketing specific to their areas of interest. I'm honored he was willing to spend some time with us today. He joins me now from Port Ludlow, Washington. Welcome, Professor Pete. Well, Mark, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. And uh, I really appreciate your time and uh, the time of your listeners. Well, let's, uh, let's get started here with, uh, with health. Uh, in many places on podcasts and in your book, you, you say, without your health, nothing else matters. And you've been open about a dysfunctional childhood, rocky relationships, divorce, suicidal family members. And you kind of had to learn the hard way that without your health, nothing else matters, right? You, back in 2008, you were diagnosed with stress-related diabetes. What, what mm -hmm. happened? That's correct. So basically back then, um, it was interesting. Uh, I had um, a perfect storm of stressful activities happening. Uh, um, I was running the business, the landscaping business, um, and, uh, you know, I didn't have a business partner at that time, so everything was on me. Uh, so I had to manage all aspects of it. I um, was... Uh, I had my dad who was, uh, had recently been put into hospice and he needed his affairs to be taken care of and those were a complete disarray. Um, my mom who lived separately, she uh, had major hip surgery and didn't have enough um, medical coverage for the uh, uh, physical therapy after, so she needed extra help. Um, my kids were small at that time, and wow. they wanted my attention. And um, oh, and uh, not surprisingly, my um, my marriage was uh, heading for a divorce. So lots yeah. of things on my shoulders. And what happened was, at one point, um, I started losing weight, and I lost. Uh, 30 pounds in 30 days. Now I was wow. in my, yeah, I was in my mid forties at that time. And it was interesting because, you know, I hadn't lost weight since my, you know, early twenties. And 
at first I thought it was fantastic because I wasn't <laughs> dieting. I was, I was doing my regular exercise and the weight just kept on coming off. And, um, so then after the 30th pound came off, I thought, mm, I better get this checked out. And sure enough, blood work came back and doctors told me that, uh, I got stress induced diabetes. And here's the crazy thing. A, there's nobody in my family that has diabetes and B, I did like what a, any type A entrepreneur would have done. It was basically, I don't have time to deal with this. I just need to keep burning the candle at both ends. <laughs> and, right. and so I kept on plugging away. Um, and I did that for another 10 years until I ended up in the emergency room with a severe case of diabetic ketoacidosis. Wow. And um, for your listeners who don't know what that is, uh, basically my body was eating itself alive because of my stress. Wow. And even then, at that point, uh, I, I was you know, running uh, the landscaping business and I was working full time. One of my old bosses had talked me into coming back um, to his, the company he had uh, went to work for. Um, and I was reporting to this micromanager. And so when I got this diabetic ketoacidosis, I was in the emergency room. The doctors told me I was one hour from being comatose. And then they transferred me for the first time in my life to ICU. And I was in ICU for three days. And on my second day in ICU, my micromanagement boss at the time texts me at 6 a.m., while you're and, in the you know, my, why, and, and, and she, you know, she knew that I was in the hospital. Wow. And she says, you have a webinar you need to run at eight o'clock. What are you going to do about it? That's what she said on this text, right? <laughs> and I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, oh, crap, I got to take care of that. And so I went into fix it mode, as you can imagine. And I pushed the boundaries of my phone at that time. And as I'm pushing the boundaries of that, uh, the nurse on, uh, uh, on call at that point, they were checking my blood every hour. And she goes and she checks my blood. Now, when I was admitted to the hospital, my blood sugars were so high that the uh, hospital glucometers could not read them. They just said high. They estimated the lab, the, the, the hospital laboratory estimated that my blood sugars were eight to 10 times higher than normal. and when um on you know when she before she took my blood i had been slowly coming down and it was in more reasonable numbers um back to you know in the in the high 100s or uh, low 200s well all of a sudden here i am sitting there stressed out trying to 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 reschedule that webinar she takes my blood and it was like a 45 degree angle and my blood sugars had started skyrocketing again. And she says to me, this is a, a complete stranger. She says to me, you realize that's what puts you in this hospital bed in the first place. Yeah. And, and that what, was the epiphany moment that I, that I needed to hear because I, people well, I gotta ask, this. I gotta, I'm sorry to cut in, but what I gotta ask, why, why are you not freaking out about dying? Like you're in the ICU. That's it. Why are you yeah. not freaking out about that first? Because I was ba basically the way I was wired was that I have to take care of everything else first, uh -huh. either my job or my coworkers or my kids or mm -hmm. other family members. Everybody always came first. Yeah. And that was what I was doing. And when she told me that, I realized oh my gosh, going to your original question that, you know, without your health, nothing else matters. And I realized that I was trading my health for my career. And that is a really bad trade. Yeah. And so you can't win that one. I mean, <laughs> you cannot, you cannot. And um, so I had no choice. I had to, because, you know, I want to be around to, to eventually meet my grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm, and, and if I kept on going the same direction I was going, uh, that was not going to necessarily happen. Yeah. Well, let, let's talk stress management, um, mm -hmm. you know, and how you got unwired, I guess. And, mm -hmm. you know, to, uh, 
you know, I want to discuss one thing that we all know that we should do. We all know this already. And that's to put down the phone, close the social media app. Mm-hmm. You, you've got a video out about it and you, mm-hmm. uh, and a recent uh, LinkedIn post on detoxing from, from technology. In, mm-hmm. in the post about a month ago, and this is how I know that you walk the walk, not just talk the talk. I, I know that you, you're the real deal. Uh, you, you've got a quote about you hibernated your account. And I, I guess mm-hmm. you went on vacation to celebrate your wife's birthday. Mm-hmm. And, you know, uh, I mean, you've got a lot of followers. And so, you know, there's this sort of a sense of responsibility to remain consistent. But, you know, you put it away to go spend time with your wife, which is awesome. Tell us why that's important. I mean, other than obviously celebrating her birthday, but more importantly, how we can put the phone down and close the apps. Because like I said, we know we should, yet we still do it. Yeah, well, you know, a great question or a great way to think about it is, you know, now that we're still, you know, coming out of the pandemic, thank goodness. But, you know, before the pandemic, how many times, you know, would you see Mark go to a restaurant and notice people sitting at the at the table and all they're doing is they're not talking to each other they're just sitting on their phones a family right? of four like I a mean, family of four and they're all, and they're all yeah, of them. yeah yeah and so i always wondered about that why are you doing that instead of um you know, making, you know, being present with that other person that's at the table. Mm -hmm. And that's the key is that we need to be present. And, you know, uh, my wife and I, we have this uh, agreement that if we, um, if we don't have the other person's attention, we will wait until we Mm -hmm. have it. So Mm -hmm. in other words, we don't talk. Yeah. And so then you all of a sudden, you know, you're, you're talking that you hear voice, blah, 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 blah. And then all of a sudden it goes quiet. <laughs> and like, you know, there every now and then we'll see a, you know, a commercial, let's say on TV and it has no sound. And you think immediately what happened Did the TV audio break or something. Right. Um, it catches our attention. And so the key is, is to be present. And mm. it's not that we have to put the phone away permanently, but can't, you know, to be able to put it away for the hour, hour and a half that you're going to be at dinner, you would be so surprised you being the the person who doesn't, hasn't tried this, what a difference the conversation is going to be like. Yeah. And, you know, it's, 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 we get so addicted to our technology and we forget that we're humans first. Yeah. And, you know, it's so important to be able to do that. And when I, you know, with my, um, uh, LinkedIn account by hibernating it. Um, what was wonderful was that not only was I not tempted to go in there and check it, but I wasn't getting the prompts saying, "Oh, somebody couldn't, wants to connect with you." Oh, the or notifications! Some, yeah, yeah, all the notifications. You know about those, Mark? And I did. <laughs> so, you know, so I could be a hundred percent present for our vacation, and it was, you know, I wouldn't change that. Uh, yeah. You know, because it's it's important, and you know, you can say that. Um, okay, I'm only going to check it first thing in the morning on vacation, first thing in the morning, and first time, uh, you know, or late in the evening or something. But the reality is, so you know, when we are working, 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 we don't give our mind nor our body the opportunity to recharge. And mm. if we are check, you know, if we're on vacation, or let's say we're checking our messages in the evenings, on the weekends, every day on our vacation, we are robbing our mind and body from the opportunity to fully recharge. Yeah. There's a reason why we're supposed to have vacation. It's to get away from work. Yeah. And so, um, you know, we can do this. We just have to have the, um, you know, the willingness to give it a try. And so I always suggest to people that, you know, the, the dinner is a great one. Just turn off the phone or better yet, leave the phone in the car when you go into the restaurant, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. Because yeah. it's too easy to say, oh, let me just check that. Oh, that's a good question. Let me surf and find that. It's, and, you know, you just, you want to be able to enjoy the, not the other person, the, the conversation that you're going to have. And, you know, we, at least I know I took this for granted uh, that I didn't realize this until after the pandemic. 
the overall just environment of the restaurant. <laughs> I'm out there. I mean, hearing the buzz of the right. restaurant and You'd you know, people laughing. You've seen the glow of the, all the little handheld devices just glowing up people's faces all over. The <laughs> exactly, exactly. And so it's, you know, it really, it doesn't take a lot. And, um, you know, so I, I remember talking with a few people about, you know, this, that they said that, oh, especially working at home during the pandemic, it was really hard to uh, disengage. And one uh, idea in addition to the detoxing that that is um, a, a really good one is an end of day anchor. Because um, if we have something that signals to our mind that we are done for the day hmm. with work, that we can make that a habit, then we can make the mental transition to our personal life. And so for me, um, I work out of the house. And so, uh, and my wife, she works at the local hospital. And um, so she, you know, especially with COVID, because she's in the lab, um, she's been working a lot of hours and it's been very stressful. When I hear the garage door opening, that is my signal, my end of day anchor right. to finish up the last email I'm working on or whatever it is, wrap that up and shut it down because it's time to be present. That's, and that's, so, yeah, that's funny. Cause I, where I live here in Japan, I, um, uh, it's a somewhat, it, it is not somewhat, it is a rural area, but I live across from a, a <laughs> the street from this sort of speaker that it goes off at three times a day. It goes off mm -hmm. at 6 a.m. and it goes off at noon, letting everyone know it's lunchtime. And it, uh, it goes off at 5 p.m. And when that sucker goes off at 5, and I, it, because it's across the street, I can hear it loud and clear. And when it, uh, it's just like a 20 second chime that goes off every day. And, uh, when that goes off at five, I'm like, it's quitting time. Like I just, I, you know, I'm not doing, unless I'm really in say like doing some work on the podcast or something. And even then I don't push it much further. I'm like that bell went off. I'm done. It's time it's, to spend time with my wife. It's time to have dinner, you know, and I just, you know, I got to focus on other stuff. So. I love that. It kind of reminds me of the old Fred Flintstone uh, intro. Yeah. If you remember <laughs> that out yeah, oh, no, in the quitting time. Woo. It's sure, <laughs> I'm like Fred. I'm like, you know, sliding through and uh, it's over. Um, well, I've heard you as a guest on some other podcasts uh, discuss quick and easy stress relief ideas other than detoxing from technology. What else you got for us? What's a universal tip, um, a technique that, that all of us can apply? Oh, this is one, one of my favorite. I'll walk you right through it because it only takes a minute. So it's, uh, it's called visualization. And uh, basically, what I'd like you to do is close your eyes and take a deep breath in. And I'd like you to go in your mind to a place you like to relax. Maybe it's the beach. Maybe it's a lake. Maybe it's a park, maybe it's your backyard, maybe, maybe it's the spa. Wherever it is, go there now and take in all of your senses. So what do you feel? Do you feel the sun on your face? Maybe the sand or the grass under your feet? What do you smell? Do you smell the fresh air? Maybe the lotion from the spa. What do you hear? Do you hear the wind blowing through the trees? Maybe the water splashing on shore? What do you see? Do you see the blue sky? Maybe the green of the trees or the grass? Whatever it is, take it all in and then take another deep breath in. And open your eyes. Hmm. How's you that go. feel? That was great. I actually, yeah. could, I could feel the. I, I have a spot that, uh, in mind when as soon as you mentioned it, and so I mentally put myself there, and it was as if I could feel like a nice breeze. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was pretty cool. Well, and that's why I, I said to take in all of your senses because if you incorporate visualizing your senses 
and mm. using your imagination as part of that, that makes it more real. And it's all about grounding yourself. Mm. And so, and we can do that at any place. Um, you know, obviously you wouldn't want to do that while you're driving while down you're driving. the road or highway, but think about, let's say that, um, you've just pulled up in front of uh, a building where you have to make an important sales call, or maybe you're going to interview in that location and you're a little bit nervous. This is a great exercise to do that. And, you know, if uh, you're working in an office with others, this is something where you can do it at your desk. Mm. Again, it only takes one minute. I know people who have actually done it in a bathroom stall sure. <laughs> you know, it's just you do it wherever you can but that yeah. it, it, it it's a very easy one that anyone can do and yeah. everybody has a place that they you know it, that they like you know yeah. whatever that is and um you know that's that that's where you want to imagine yourself uh so that you can yeah. you can feel you know feel more calm and uh and yeah. relaxed yeah, in essence, you're just going through a, a kind of guided meditation in your mind. Correct. Right. Correct. Um, yeah, a, a brief funny story about don't do it in the car. Uh, years ago, I was I was driving from California uh, to my home state of Alabama, and I mm -hmm. uh, so I'm driving across country, and so I was listening to a bunch of audio books, and I had one from I don't know if you're familiar with John Cabot Zinn, but he uh, he is sort of one of the early proponents. Uh, I don't know if founders, but you know of um, mindfulness, this buzzword we hear so much these days, you know, there was a study done, I think at Boston University back in the 70s, he was a part of the, you know, kind of groundbreaking studies that were about this. Anyway, he had a book, and I'm listening to this mindfulness audio book driving, you know, and uh, I know you're on the West Coast, you've probably been all over the country, you know, there's a lot of desert roadway, oh, yeah. and I'm sitting here driving, listening to this mindfulness thing, and, uh, you know, I had to pull off the road, I'm like, man, I'm about to... <laughs> pass out here <laughs> i was getting so, I almost, <laughs> so in the zone you know? i almost did the same thing once too it's it, it can it can happen you know if the if, if it, i like the fact that you mentioned about the the kind of like a meditation thing there is actually something um if you want to do one other one that is closer to a meditation but it doesn't require you to close your eyes hmm. if you're if you're interested it takes just a minute as well sure we can do that Okay, so this one, um, it's called Hakalau, and it actually comes from uh, the Hawaiian culture. And this one, what it's designed to do is it, it helps you if you are about to deal with um, a perceived stressful situation. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is um, you first, you pick a spot on the wall, preferably above eye level, a stationary spot. And you just start staring at that spot. All right. And as you stare at this spot, you'll notice that, you know, your mind starts to go loose as you focus all of your attention on that spot. And after a matter of moments, your vision starts to spread out. And you see more in the peripheral than you do in the central part of your vision. And take, pay a little bit more attention to the peripheral than the central part of your vision. And just stay in that state for as long as you feel comfortable, at least a few more seconds. And notice how that feels. And when you're ready, go ahead and close your eyes, open your eyes, come back into the room. And you'll notice that you're calmer and you're more aware of your surroundings and better able to take on whatever that perceived stressful event is. Yeah, certainly calmer. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it certainly works. There's a, uh, there's a TED Talk that I, I um, found I don't know, a year or two ago, and I have found it to be pretty effective and it's similar. And uh, it's like, because uh, I, I do a couple of public speaking events and, uh, and even though I do them more often than the average person, you know, you'd think I'm super comfortable with it. Um, 
maybe I'm more comfortable than the average person, but I still, I still get butterflies in the stomach or whatever. It's natural. Uh, this Ted talk, uh, had, it, it had suggested that when you're feeling nervous like that, say before an event that you identify three things in the room, like this is a lamp, that is a mm-hmm. door, you know, that, that is a, a, a chair, you know, and you do that. And by focusing your attention on those things and, and do that, you know, if you need to repeat that three or nine times or whatever, um, it's weird how it works. It does just sort of like take, I guess it, it takes you out of all that anxiety, that moment, because you're sitting in there just build up. I got to go do some public speaking or whatever it is. And you're so focused on that. It just, it steals your attention away from that and just right. something else. You know? It's a, it's very similar to disassociation so mm-hmm. that um, you're able to not be so f- single-minded focused on one particular thing that could be making you worried. Right. And um, by, a, by checking out the peripheral or as you say, you know, things that are in the environment, you are focusing on other things that are supposed to help distract your nervous mind. Right. Good. Well, uh, so I know that you used to do a, uh, a podcast called winning at business and life mm-hmm. a podcast. You did over 300 episodes. The, uh, the, the concept is super cool. It's six questions in seven minutes. Mm-hmm. Uh, and your podcast was with successful business leaders. So as a kind of quick fire Q and a here, let me turn the tables on you. Sure. These are similar questions, but I'm going to change it just a little bit on you. Uh, okay. So number one, in a few sentences, tell me who you are other than a professor, author, and entrepreneur. Uh, I am an avid hiker and uh, have been able to summit uh, Mount Kilimanjaro, Mount Whitney, Mount Shasta, Mauna Kea, Mount ah. Fuji, and uh, have a few other uh, um, uh, summits that I would like to uh, be able to put on my uh, checked off list uh, before I'm done. So, uh, so Wonderful. that's, that's another one that, that would be there. Yeah. Wow, that's <laughs> awesome. I've done Fuji, but I had none of those other ones, but uh, that's, that's great. Um, number two, what is something that makes you smile and or laugh, not related to business or industry? It could be a movie or, or movies. It could be comedians, whatever. Oh yeah. You know, it's, it's funny. Um, so, My dad was, uh, I don't know how old uh, your listeners are, but if if they ever heard (laughs) of vaudeville, this was a a stage kind of uh, events that happened prior to the advent of television. (laughs) He was a child performer and um, he had so many jokes. And um, so what happens now is I'm able to uh, help people laugh when I happen to hear a particular word, that's how I remember the jokes is I hear a particular word or subject or something like that. And I can actually, you know, come up with a, a, a joke usually from that. And it's just from this database in my head of <laughs> useless information. And that's so, awesome. um, so that, that, that's uh, something that makes me laugh uh, because if I can get people to laugh at a, at a particular joke that they haven't, uh, that mm. they haven't heard before um, that they appreciate, then that's something that, uh, that I've uh, been able to, to, to help somebody smile and laugh because laughter, it's really true. Laughter is the best medicine there's no I, doubt about it i agree with that uh other than your own book lighten your day what mm-hmm. is your favorite book fiction or nonfiction? oh boy there's a couple of them uh one that i would um from a business standpoint you know f- uh non-fiction would be the slight edge um and basically the premise of that book is the author talks about doing just a little bit more whatever that means in your business, because if you do that consistently, you will be the leader in, um, uh, in the, uh, in your market, you eventually (laughs) will get that way. So that's, that's a, that's a really, really good one. And then from um, my own personal and I, 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 it's more self-help than it is um, uh, uh, nonfiction, but uh, it's, um, it's uh, Rhonda Burns, the magic and about gratitude. And it's just 30 days 
of gratitude activities. That to me was a, a game changer. Nice. And, uh, you know, it's, it's amazing because um, I've worked with a lot of people who, you know, their career or whatever they're doing for work is their biggest source of stress. And, uh, you know, if they're working for somebody and, and uh, they, you know, are unhappy in their work, you know, one of the activities that um, was inspired from uh, uh, Burns book is to find, you know, a list of five to 10 things that you are grateful to about your job, even mm. if you hate your job, right? Find gratitude in it. <laughs> I, I've, uh, I've mentioned on this podcast before, you know, uh, about when discussing like, you know, getting down and out about things. I'm like, there's things that you can be grateful for. Like, if you're listening to this podcast, you can hear. <laughs> you, you Absolutely. Can hear hearing. Like, yeah. There's, and I went and looked up the statistics. The UN statistics are uh, like 5% of the world has difficulty hearing, you know. Absolutely. Like, that's something to be grateful for. It really is. And, uh, and, you know, being grateful, you don't have to be grateful for the big things in your life, right. the very small things, you know, and my, my wife and I do a gratitude exercise every night. And mm -hmm. I ask her, what is she grateful for that happened today? What am I grateful for? She asks me. Mm -hmm. And uh, we recap, you know, what, uh, what things come to mind. And that's a great way to end the day. Mm, I agree. Uh, number four, I'm going to keep this one almost the same as you have uh, that you asked it on, your, on that podcast. Uh, other than the generic answers of work harder, have a great attitude and care for customers, what specific advice or insight would you give to, to leaders? Uh, it could be business leaders. Um, I mean, I've worked in large corporations before and I couldn't stand training videos that were so generic. You know, we treat each guest like blah, blah, blah. I know that already, you know, and that, that generic video is not going to change my behavior. So what, you know, what advice or insight do you have? That's a great one. I would say uh, another game changer in addition to gratitude is to learn what your pers top five personal values are as it relates to your career. Hmm. So the reason is, is because if you figure out what your top five values are, then any kind of major decision you need to make, whether it's take a new job, take a promotion, um, start your own business, um, buy a competing business, whatever it happens to be, mm -hmm. you run that decision by your top five values. Mm -hmm. And if your answer is in alignment with your top five values, then it should be a go. Yeah. If forever it's not, I guarantee if you still make that decision, even though it's not in alignment with your personal values, guarantee you are going to add unnecessary stress to your life. So know what your personal values are. And one of my um, blog posts talks about uh, personal values. It's a very simple exercise, it takes about oh, five to 10 minutes, and mm -hmm. you, you can professionally elicit your personal values just following the video or the blog post. Yeah, I think, I think it's important for people to identify what they are. They may not have given mm -hmm. thought to, well, what are my personal values? You well, it, it, the thing is, is you can assume what they are, but uh, you need to go through an exercise to really know what they are. Yeah, cool. Uh, number five, what other leaders or motivators not in the business world? It could be the Dalai Lama. It could be an actor or a politician. Hopefully it's not a politician. Uh, do you admire and look up to? Oh, I would have to say um, uh, one that I admire is, is Tom Hanks. He, um, you know, he comes to mind. Uh, he's he's uh, been somebody who I have had on the radar actually a lot longer than most people because he and my sister went to the same high school. Oh, wow. Same year. <laughs> and um, he, uh, it was funny because I didn't know. And um, one of my friends uh, said, hey, this is this guy, Tom Hanks, when he was on this TV show called Bosom Buddies. Yeah, I remember. Um, yeah, he, <laughs> I was a kid, uh, he, but I remember it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> um, you know, and for those of you who don't know that, you should look it up because uh, basically it was Tom Hanks and, uh, and his buddy, Peter Scolari, yep. who would dress up as women so that they could uh, live in a women's only apartment <laughs> building, I think in New York City, if I'm not mistaken. But um, 
Was uh, he on soap as well? Was he on soap or the other? No, guys? no, that okay. was um, uh, that, that. He wasn't on soap. Peter Scolari, I don't wasn't on soap either. I think you might be thinking Billy Crystal. Yeah, maybe so. Anyway, okay. go ahead. Sorry. So anyway, um, but uh, so I remember um, seeing this show and then uh, at, uh, calling my 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 sister up and saying, "Hey, did you do you do you remember Tom Hanks?" And she goes, yeah, I remember Tom. He was one of this, those weird drama guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, it paid off. <laughs> it sure did. And, um, you know, I've, I, anytime I've heard him interviewed, he, I, I just, you know, he seems like a good guy. He, yeah, you know, he does. He, and in fact, like one, yeah, that like uh, celebrity, and I mean, you're talking top, top list celebrity, like at the very top, mm-hmm. that celebrity didn't get the better of him, whether That's it's correct. like, drugs or or narcissism or any of that stuff like i mean he's still married i think to the same wife of like Mm -hmm. 30 something years Mm -hmm. you know and Mm -hmm. um he just seems to be amazingly grounded for someone who is on such a high elevated you know social status absolutely you know because i've always believed that the way you know treat people the way that you want to be treated. Absolutely. And that really, you know, that you can really see what a person is like if you see how they treat somebody like, um, you know, a, a restaurant server or, mm. you know, That's... somebody, you know, a cashier or something yeah. like that. And um, so, you know, I, I, I really like how he um, had, inter- um, you know, he, he communicates with people. And uh, I got a kick out of the fact that um, he posted, he had several posts on, uh, uh, I think it was either Twitter or Instagram for a while, because he used to be, um, he used to work in the Oakland Coliseum for the Oakland A's as one of the vendors, you know, junk food, selling <laughs> junk food and stuff like that. And, and, you know, and he still, you know, roots for the A's and, uh, you know, and it's just, it, it just down to earth kind of stuff. Mm. Whereas, you know, you get a lot of these, uh, these, these celebrities who they feel like they're, you know, yeah. they're better they're than you lose themselves. Sure. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, and I will steal your last question as well. What was your first job? Mine was at Chuck E. Cheese, by the way. Oh, oh no. my <laughs> goodness. Okay. Well, I wonder. <laughs> I, I, I never Top realized that one. How, yeah. <laughs> well, I never realized how much I disliked uh, Chuck E. Cheese until I was a parent myself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, could, I wouldn't step foot in one of those places again, but uh, you know, what was your first job? <laughs> so my, my first um, paid job was as a paper boy. <clears throat> and um, that was uh, an interesting experience because um I would have to get up very early in the morning and I'd have to ride my bike down to the Walgreens because they would drop off the, the newspapers. It was for the Oakland Tribune. And uh, it would be, um, they drop it off in front of the Walgreens because the Walgreens was lit up so we could see. And I did that for about three months until one day I was getting my papers ready and um, a car pulled up and these teenagers came and mugged me for my bike wow. and my i had a little am oh, radio man. and so i got mugged for my radio and my bike <laughs> oh, <that was> terrible. <laughs> um, so uh and then my first payroll job was as a uh as a bus boy for a uh a, a, a diner and um boy i tell you um after i had that experience I didn't eat in diners for a long time <laughs> because of how dirty things are. Yeah. <laughs> yep. I've worked in my share of restaurants and yep, I know the, the dark secrets. Um, well, at the end of each episode, I do a little segment called five minutes Zen, and, um, and uh, believe it or not, something happened to me right before we, we started talking right before this interview that it gave me the, fir- the perfect question to ask you. Uh, so anyway, in five minutes in, I don't, you know, I, I'm not offering any kind of like, it doesn't have to be Zen related. I'm not mm-hmm. this, I, I say that this uh, podcast is not for the aspiring Buddhist monk or anything. This is just practical down to earth advice. So before this interview, I got super frustrated with somebody on social media and I'm di- disappointed in myself actually, because I am usually pretty calm about, you know, uh, stuff these days and I just ignore it. I mean, I, I have a podcast with Zen in the title for good and sex. Mm-hmm. Uh, I wasn't very Zen. I, somebody pissed me off. Uh, I am human after all. Um, <laughs> what stress reliever 
should I have applied when that happened? What can we all do when we're cruising along and everything's fine? And then some jackass cajoles us into a fruitless debate. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, I shouldn't have gotten into the debate in the first place, honestly, but what's done is done. It happened. What can I do at that point after it's too late? I've already engaged in the debate. You know, this could be a road rage thing too that happens to people. You're cruising along, everything's fine. What can we do then to relieve our stress? Yeah, so that's a it's a it's a really good question because it can happen in any particular um, situation, as as you mentioned, Mark. And one thing that comes to my mind is this um, uh, interesting technique called STOP, and that's the acronym for it. And uh, the S in STOP does stand for stop. <laughs> okay, stop. That's easy to remember. All right. And basically, what you want to do is get yourself away from the situation. Okay. Mm. And what you want to do is um, you take yourself away. So that's the T. Mm -hmm. You take yourself away from the, okay. the situation. And then you go like, say, for example, uh, somebody at work has frustrated you. You might be able to take yourself away for go for a walk or go into the bathroom, someplace where you're by yourself mm -hmm. because you need to clear your mind. And then what you want to do is you want to observe what you're feeling. Okay. What is it? that was provoked inside of you. Because the reality is um, that it wasn't necessarily that particular thing that that particular person said that was the root cause of whatever got you upset. Hmm. There was probably something else to it. Um, I know this, uh, this episode is, is airing in April, but uh, I'm sure people are going to remember um, Will Smith on this the Oscars. This is what it had to exactly. do with. Yes. Okay. So, and that's the was thing. About he could that. have used. He could have used this. This. This thing. You know, observe it. There, obviously, him going up there with Chris Rock. It wasn't just that joke. There's right. something else going something on there. Going on. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So you observe it, and you take you know, notice what is it that you're feeling, et cetera. Just take inventory of yourself. It, it mm. doesn't take long. It takes just a few minutes in there. Right. And then the P is to proceed back to what I like to call the scene of the crime, wherever <laughs> it first uh, happened with a clearer mind so that you don't go there and slap somebody like, you <laughs> yeah. know, like what happened and yeah. be embarrassed, you know, and, and now there's the outrage about that. You, you, you can have a calmer, calmer yeah. mind about it. And so the, I would consider the stop technique. It's another one that's on my, uh, yeah. uh, on my uh, blog. I love it. Stop. Uh, take yourself out of the situation, observe what's going on and then proceed back to, the, the scene of the crime. <laughs> exactly. Once yeah. you're ready, once yeah. you're ready, once, once you're, you're ready. Yeah. It's <laughs> funny that you brought that up because that's what it was about. And I, I won't relive the whole debate, but you know, someone had was, was on Will Smith's side and I, and I'm, I, again, I'm not trying to re-energize the debate here, but I had just brought up that like, you know, if someone says something disrespectful, of course I might want to hit somebody, but violence is not the answer, you know, right. and, and don't, well, the person and I and I had used the word I said you know that's what children do I don't like what you're saying so I'm going to hit you I'm going to hurt you and you know as an adult we shouldn't do that and then the person had you know made a sort of straw man argument where they're like well don't bring kids into this I'm, like, I'm not bringing kids into this I'm saying it's childish to act that way <laughs> anyway I uh, see I'm still worked up about I got I got to stop I got to <laughs> Take myself out. I got to observe what's going on. I'll, I'll come back to this. But, well, and there's and there's there's one other thing too with that particular person in particular. Um, there's a uh, a technique that um, that I I have a recording it linked off of uh, one of my blog posts uh, called Ho'oponopono, and it's another Hawaiian. Um, uh, technique and it's a forgiveness exercise mm. and you do it in your mind you forgive that other person mm. and so uh, that might be something um that uh you want to go ahead and take a look at i'm going to look um, it up after this first. interview <laughs> absolutely absolutely because it is um it's a uh it's a wonderful exercise and it helps um you to let go of whatever it is inside of you that um is festering mm. and it's amazing how forgiving the other person can release that tension. Hmm. I like it. So, uh, well, what do you got going on lately? Uh, you mentioned the blog, um, and I've mentioned the book. Well, I'll put links of that stuff in the show notes. 
Well, uh, where can people find you on social media? Where can they buy the book? Sure. So um, probably uh, LinkedIn is the best place to find me, uh, Professor Pete Alexander. Um, I'm also on Facebook. Um, feel free to reach out to me there. Uh, those are the two I'm most active with. And uh, as far as the book, they can find it on Amazon. They can come to um, my website at PeteAlexander.com okay. and uh, find the book there. Um, and, uh, if, you know, I can uh, mail it if it's in the U.S. I can mail it to them directly with a, as a signed copy if they decide they want to, uh, to order one. Uh, directly from me. So look me up there. The blog is is there too with uh, a whole bunch of different suggestions and videos as well. Nice. That's all at PeteAlexander.com, correct? That's correct. Okay. I'll, I'll put that stuff in the, uh, the notes. So uh, folks, after you buy Lighten Your Day, Fast, Easy, and Effective Stress Relief, uh, first do that. Then if you got three bucks left over, which is nothing, you can help this show out by going to patreon.com slash sandsandwich. And when you do that, I will mail you a postcard on washi. That's traditional Japanese paper that my wife and I make uh, here in Japan. That's what we do for a living. And I will, uh, I'll send you that postcard to wherever you are in the world. And I'll give you a shout out on the show like I did uh, uh, Rosemary at the beginning here. Uh, Professor Pete, uh, I'll send you a postcard if uh, after we get off, off air here. If I can get an address for you, I'll, I'll send you one just, you know, for a thank you. Sure. Uh, thank you. All right. It's, uh, it's been enlightening. I, I really appreciate your time. Well, I appreciate your time too, Mark, and I really greatly appreciate uh, the listener's time as well.